Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. What would the Rockefellers do? How the wealthy get and stay that way, and how you can too. By Garrett B. Gunderson and Michael G. Isom. Chapter 1 A Critical Discovery Only the man who does not need it is fit to inherit wealth. The man who would make his own fortune no matter where he started. If an heir is equal to his money, it serves him. If not, it destroys him. But you look on and you cry that money corrupted him. Did it? Or did he corrupt the money? Francisco D'Anconia Atlas Shrugged Imagine one of your great-grandchildren presiding over a family fortune of tens of millions of dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars and imagine that whenever your great-grandchild receives a check to help pay for education or to buy their first home or to start a business or even to help survive financial disasters like medical bills illness or disability your grandchild gives a quick toast to your memory your grandchild toasts to you because you started it all you amassed wealth and left behind a set of values and a financial legacy to shepherd that wealth. Is this possible? Is it possible for you not just to leave your kids better off than you were, but to spark a financial legacy of wealth and empowerment that lasts for generations? Yes, it is. It's possible to create a family fortune that lives on in perpetuity, benefiting generation after generation after you, and it's possible to do it without creating trust fund babies who know how to spend money and little else. Instead, your wealth can be used to empower future generations. It can act as a launching pad for all of their endeavors, whether those are professional, academic, charitable or entrepreneurial in nature it's not easy and does take careful planning but it has been done for real world examples we need only look to America's past in the 19th and early 20th centuries two of America's wealthiest businessmen amassed incredible fortunes that each separately towered over the fortunes of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Mark Zuckerberg combined. Their names were Cornelius Vanderbilt and John D. Rockefeller, and the story of what happened to their fortunes embodies a lesson for anyone planning to leave wealth for the next generation. The Fortune of Cornelius Vanderbilt Cornelius Vanderbilt made his fortune in the transportation business, starting by ferrying goods and passengers around New York Harbor in the early 19th century. Soon, his business expanded to shipping goods from the West Coast to the East Coast, using Nicaragua as a passageway. Eventually, he switched from ships to trains, where he made his largest fortune yet in the railroad business. At his death in 1877, Vanderbilt's fortune was estimated to top $100 million, which was more than the U.S. Treasury held at the time. That's more than $200 billion with a B in today's dollars. But even as the richest man in America, Vanderbilt lived a relatively modest life. He gave some money to charity, he donated one million to help start Vanderbilt University, and he also donated to churches. But 95% of his fortune was passed on to his son, William Henry Vanderbilt, leaving his surviving wife and children to split the rest. William Henry Vanderbilt did well, doubling the family fortune before his death, nine years after the passing of his father. But that was the last time the Vanderbilt family fortune would grow. 
the Vanderbilt heirs became known as wealthy socialites with a penchant for lavish spending. There were ten Vanderbilt mansions built in Manhattan, including the largest private residence ever built there, plus several more around the country. Many of these homes seem more like palaces, such as the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island, which still stands today. But without any new money coming in, the fortune couldn't survive the spendthrift Vanderbilt heirs. By 1947, all ten Vanderbilt Manhattan mansions had been torn down. It is said that Cornelius Vanderbilt's last words were, Keep the money together. But the Vanderbilt heirs failed fabulously. The family fortune was squandered in just a handful of generations. A direct descendant of Cornelius died broke just 40 years after he did. The Fortune of John D. Rockefeller John D. Rockefeller made his fortune selling oil and kerosene. He started Standard Oil of Ohio in 1870, and by the end of the decade his business was refining more than 90% of the oil in the United States. Rockefeller's objective was to deliver the best oil at the cheapest price. He once wrote to a partner, We must ever remember we are refining oil for the poor man and he must have it cheap and good and Rockefeller succeeded, pushing the price of oil down from 58 cents to 8 cents a gallon. The result was that Rockefeller became the richest man in American history. The New York Times said in Rockefeller's 1937 obituary that he had amassed more than $1.5 billion. In today's dollars, estimates of his wealth vary between $240 billion and $341 billion. Rockefeller was a prolific giver, donating more than $530 million of his fortune to charity during his lifetime. He also left $460 million to his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., otherwise known as Junior, in 1917. Unlike the Vanderbilts, Junior kept the family money together by creating a trust for each of his children, a daughter and five sons. The bulk of the family fortune was put into these trusts, managed by a group of financial professionals referred to as the Family Office, which would provide Junior's kids with interest income. Six generations later, the family office is still managing the Rockefeller fortune, which is estimated to be more than 10 billion. More than 150 Rockefellers currently receive interest income from the family trusts, and the family is said to donate as much as 50 million per year to charity, carrying on the senior Rockefellers tradition of philanthropy. Choosing the Rockefeller Method what made the difference? Why did the Rockefellers keep their fortune while the Vanderbilts lost everything? The answer, ironically, is that the Rockefellers heeded the last words of Vanderbilt. They did keep the money together, using trusts as a legal tool to protect the fortune as much as possible from taxes, lawsuits, and spendthrift heirs. This wise financial planning has empowered six generations of Rockefellers, and many Rockefellers have found success in business and politics, with three governors, a senator, and a United States vice president among John D. Rockefeller's descendants. Conversely, the last well-known Vanderbilt descendant is the television host Anderson Cooper, who had to fight his way into the industry even forging press credentials to get a chance to report news. The Vanderbilt fortune was not there to help. The lesson is clear. If you want to empower your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, don't simply leave the money to spend as they please. Keep the money together. Design trusts that direct how money can and cannot be spent. 
and pass on your values to the next generation so that your vision doesn't stop with you. The Rockefeller method isn't just for the Rockefellers. The two of us, Michael Isom and Garrett Gunderson, have changed our family's financial destinies by using this method and the financial strategy at its core. Michael Isom's story, most valuable tuition ever paid. I'm about to get raw with you now. On a Tuesday morning in mid-October 2010, I woke up to the noise of someone knocking on our front door. It was my father-in-law. I opened the door and said, What's up? It's early. And then I saw two large moving trucks backing into the driveway of our home. My father-in-law said, I'm here with Terry and Derek, my brothers-in-law to move Wendy and the kids out. No one is going anywhere, I said, and I slammed the door in his face. It was a complete surprise to me, but I was facing the reality of my actions. Twelve hours later, Wendy and our two kids were driving away from our home, leaving me to figure out my... I found myself on the bathroom floor screaming in shock at the reality of my family leaving me. What had I done? I felt so alone. I was scared. I was shaking, screaming, nose bleeding, snot streaming out onto the bathroom floor. Why, God, why? I asked. It may be hard to believe, but this dire situation was the direct result of a bad financial philosophy. A few years earlier, at the end of 2007, I'd found myself facing the reality of losing over four million dollars in a bad investment. Over time, leading up to this huge loss, I started to convince myself that the solution to saving and investing was to take high risk in the hope of getting a high rate return. I figured, high risk, high return. Now, what's funny is I was doing exactly what money managers are telling people to do today when it comes to investing. I was relinquishing control of this most important commodity in my family's life and mine, instead of maintaining control. I was focusing on a high rate of return outside of my control, outside of my business. It was a huge gamble, and I lost. Gambling is win-lose, not win-win. It's a zero-sum game. I had been in the financial services industry for seven years at that point, and I'd been investing for more than 14 years. I asked myself, should I have known better? What was I thinking? How did this happen? Did I get greedy? I thought to myself, shame on me. What an idiot. Little did I know the huge effect that this would have on my family and me. Because what I had risked was our family's life savings. Our retirement savings were gone. Our kids' college education money was gone. We hear about people losing money like this, and we think to ourselves, that will never happen to me. We don't grasp the concept of risk and loss until it happens to us. The true cost of subjecting that amount of money to that kind of risk and losing left me paralyzed. Mentally, I could not function. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, and months into over two years of a downward spiral. I was haunted by thoughts of suicide, major anxiety, excessive drinking, and feeling no connection with my wife and kids. I almost got divorced. I lost two years of my life that I will never get back. I was a mess in so many ways as a result of subjecting my family's life savings to that kind of risk. That Tuesday in 2010, shaking on my bathroom floor, I reached a turning point. I felt a rush come over my body that I'd never felt before. I dropped to my knees in prayer, retracing all of the steps that had led to this. I committed in that moment to extract the life lessons, overcome them, 
and never let it happen again. Suddenly, I knew what my life's purpose was all about. Finding a new way to handle money and finance that doesn't follow the high-risk, high-return paradigm and sharing it with everyone I can possibly reach so that they never, never, never have to go through the kind of pain I was in. I went to work. I went to work on myself. I knew that I had to get healthy in every area of my life to get my family back, and I did just that. Little by little, this book, that book, this class, that class, this mentor, that mentor, I crawled my way back to a prosperous life and found a way to be a responsible steward of money. I asked myself, what are the most powerful financial institutions today? The answer? Banks. They control the capital. They use other people's money and make a spread on that money. They don't take much risk, and they reap a very high rate of return. So I started thinking like a bank. I started acting like a bank. I became a bank with my own money. I started doing for myself what the safest and most profitable financial institutions in America are doing. It was a discovery that the Rockefellers had figured out long ago. I created a system for paying less in tax, safeguarding money, having access to that money along the way, earning interest rather than paying it, ensuring that money survives from generation to generation, and simplifying personal finance. No longer do you have to subject yourself to the uncertainty of the stock market or any other risky investment. You can manage your money just like a bank, and I will show you exactly how to do it. Since that low point in my life, from January 2011 until now, I've assisted more business owners and professionals across the country than I ever had in my entire career up to that point. I've earned back almost all of the money that I lost. I have clients in 40 of the 50 states. I'm now often asked to share this experience with groups across the country to show what's possible. I love my life, every area of it. My relationship with my beautiful wife Wendy has never been more fulfilling. My kids and I are closer than ever. The influence I have on them is incredible. My body is functioning at a high level. I'm mentally healthy and spiritually connected. My ability to help others with money and finance, which affects every area of their lives, is transformational. I am wealthier today than I have ever been in the past, and I am now leveraging my past experiences to create massive value in the lives of others, and you can too. This philosophy is the centerpiece of the Rockefeller Method, and it was set up to assist business professionals just like you. Money and finance play a significant role in our lives, enhancing who we are. Consider these questions in your life today. How are money and finance affecting your life today? Is it? Is it enhancing it? Do you want it to? Is it holding you hostage, keeping you in the scarcity mindset, robbing you of your life's vision? Or is it being leveraged in an empowering way to lift you and others up? Is it empowering you to expand, grow, and create in every area of your life, allowing you to live an abundant life filled with the deepest expression of who you are? This can be your reality. I know it's possible, and I can show you the way. I am humbled, appreciative, and empowered to lead you in greater wisdom, insight, and understanding on this topic of finance, money, and banking. In conclusion, what would the Rockefellers do? They value and enhance more than ever before their number one asset, themselves. You are your number one asset. 
most mainstream planners out there today who sell for the financial institutions and their agenda, more on their agenda in a later chapter, focus on property value assets only. Property value assets consist of things like your home, your business, cash savings, investments, real property, etc. There is little to no mention of one's human life value assets, HLV. HLV assets consist of things like your education, your life experiences, your integrity, your knowledge, and your personal self-worth. HLV is who you are as a person. HLV is the source and creator of all property value. It's a simple formula. Do you want more property value in your life? Then you have to increase your HLV first. And I love this about the Rockefellers the most. As they've shown us, you can leave both your property value assets and your HLV assets to your family when you pass on. It's not one or the other. Your number one investment has been and always will be your own business slash career. The Rockefellers had it figured out. Think about it. You are maintaining control versus relinquishing control. You have the most knowledge and expertise in this area. You care the most about this area. You are passionate about this area. This leads us to the number one strategy today, the Rockefeller strategy of saving. We can show you how to reserve and leave behind the greatest amount of wealth for generations to come by using this strategy. This is what we call cash flow insurance. In the chapters that follow, you will discover exactly what cash flow insurance is, how it works, and why it's the most efficient way for you to grow your wealth in coordination with everything else in your life. I am personally excited for you to benefit from these timeless strategies. Garrett Gunderson's Story I grew up in the coal mining town of East Carbon, Utah, a tiny community of only a thousand or so people where everybody knew each other. My father and my grandfather were coal miners, and I was born into financial bondage. My parents gave me everything they could by instilling great values, hard work, perseverance, and love, but they couldn't give me much in terms of money, wealth, and financial knowledge. The only person I really knew who was a business owner was my grandfather, and it was just a side business in addition to his work as a coal miner, repairing televisions, and playing in a band. As a little kid, I would go around with him as he drove his red van around to people's houses and help them repair their TVs. Everybody knew him and respected him. I would sit and watch him work in his shop, and as I grew up, I grew to admire him more and more. See, my grandfather is my hero. He was the patriarch who glued our family together. He was always family-oriented, always made time for family coming to every ball game, every birthday party. Imagine if he had all of this and the power of the Rockefeller method. When I started out in financial services at 19 years old, my family, being the nice supportive people that they are, agreed to let me help them out. I managed their money, and as the market rose in 1998 and 1999, their finances grew too. In my little community, I became a kind of Doogie Hauser MD of finance. But when the market went down in 2000, I realized that I had been riding a wave. As Warren Buffett said, you find out who's swimming naked when the tide rolls back, and I was definitely swimming naked. This was one of the most pivotal times of my life. Instead of telling people they were in it for the long haul or the market is on sale, I chose to face each one of my clients and got them completely out of the declining market between March and May of 2000. I also told them I didn't really understand what I was doing. 
My training at the time was mainly in sales and products, not in markets and strategy, and I came clean with each client about my limited training. This saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it would have been millions if I were managing more money, but I was in my very early 20s and fortunately had just started out. People saw this act as one of integrity, and it gained their trust as I saved them money and told them to find another advisor or wait until I got really clear about what to do. I did. Then, my grandfather's sister, my great aunt, got really sick and was put in the hospital. My grandfather was an Italian immigrant, and our entire family had adopted a scarcity mindset when it came to money. He rarely spent money on anything other than his grandkids. Frugal would be the nice way to put it. And if my grandfather was frugal, my great aunt was beyond frugal. A miser. She put money in Folger's coffee cans, which she put in the cellar or buried in the backyard. She applied for welfare even though she had over half a million dollars in her savings account. They never talked about money, wealth, or value creation, or taught anyone anything about stewardship. All they did with the money they made was hoard it. My great aunt, who never married, stored all of the family money in her account, even though two-thirds of it belonged to her siblings. When she went into the hospital, my grandfather and their other sister sat me down and said, Garrett. We really need your help. No one was just being nice now. They needed to figure out how to use their money to care for my great aunt and avoid losing it to nursing care expenses and medical care costs. So I came up with a strategy for them whereby they could take care of their sister without having the money that was meant for all three of them evaporate in a year or two. I felt really good about helping my family out in that way, and my family was pretty impressed with me. But then, my grandfather looked at me and said, When you graduate, are you going to get a real job? Even after I had helped them with this great financial strategy, my grandfather didn't really believe that being in business was a real job. To him, and to my mother, it wasn't stable or secure enough. It seemed like a risk and unfamiliar territory. Maybe the long trip to the United States from Italy had created a mantra to never put the family at financial risk, but unfortunately this caution had turned into scarcity-based thinking. My grandfather and father both worked for unions that went on strike. I remember my dad eating crackers for weeks at a time because he and my mom didn't have money for food while the miners union was on strike. And yet, they felt being a business owner wasn't stable. I was incredibly confused, and as I went through my senior year of college, I got more and more depressed. I couldn't see a clear vision of my future. I had job offers from Arthur Anderson, Merrill Lynch. American Investment Bank, and Strong Investments, which was the number two investment family in the world at the time. But because of the doubt instilled by my family's concerns, I was constantly questioning myself, asking if I could really do it or if I should just take one of these job offers. Even though I was already making money in the financial services field, I almost made the decision to move to Milwaukee to work for Strong Investments. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, said to me, I don't know if I want to go to Milwaukee, but you should follow your dreams. The problem was, I couldn't tell if that's what I was doing. Even in school, nobody was encouraging me to stay in business, with the exception of one professor, the dean of the business school. Dean Templin. In a meeting, Dean Templin said to me, You're already making more than all of your professors. Why would you take advice from them on what you want to do for a career? They're here to give you education in other areas. You just do what you're doing. 
and as it turned out, by helping one of my professors, who had been a fund manager previously, I ended up making a commission that was more than any of the salaries from these other job offers. So I decided to stay in business, even though it wasn't a real job according to my family, and when I showed my grandfather my bank account to let him know that everything was going to be okay, and told him about all the ways I was helping my clients, he started to tell everyone about me. Not a day went by in which he didn't get teary-eyed telling me how proud he was of me. He realized that I was doing what I loved to do, and that I was changing the future and financial destiny of our family. The strategy I ended up teaching my grandfather and his sister was the first piece of the Rockefeller method. This knowledge can give you the chance to change your family's financial future so that the next generation isn't born into financial bondage. I started the first phase of this strategy by using cash flow insurance in 1998 as a foolproof strategy, and it has evolved into something that I will use to perpetuate my legacy our family will be able to advance instead of starting over every time someone from the previous generation passes away. I'll be able to take what my grandfather wished he could have given me and give that opportunity to future generations. And you will too. This methodology allowed my grandparents to leave an extra $250,000 to their heirs tax-free while enjoying a fuller life the last 10 years they were alive. That $250,000 may sound small, but they lived in a community where houses sold for $20,000 to $40,000. So how do you leave a financial legacy that will empower your family for years? For my family, we will implement the Rockefeller method, and we will do everything we can to avoid the Vanderbilt way. I believe the Rockefeller method, where wealth is centralized and directed by a carefully planned trust, is the best way to perpetuate, preserve, and protect wealth. That's why I've invested substantial time and energy designing the financial legacy that I will leave my family, along with finding the right person to help, of course. Andrew L. Howell is my estate planning and asset protection attorney, and he's helped me create a plan that will empower my kids and their kids and hopefully many generations after that. As the grandson of prominent estate planning attorney Max B. Lewis, and the beneficiary of a family trust himself, Andrew is the foremost expert on the topic of making family fortunes last. Recently, Andrew co-wrote the book Entrusted, Building a Legacy That Lasts with his law partner David R. York. On page 118, they describe the challenges of making family wealth survive more than just a few generations. Preserving and protecting financial wealth requires an understanding of, and a solid plan for, counteracting the three primary forces that erode wealth over multiple generations, just as water, wind, and gravity work to erode natural monuments three forces work to erode financial wealth over multiple generations. 1. The division of assets among the generations. 2. Transfer taxes and capital gains taxes. 3. Business risks and third-party attacks. Studies have shown that as a result of these three forces, financial wealth doesn't last past the third generation in 90% of high net worth families. This truism has sometimes been expressed as shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, an American translation of the Lancashire proverb, there's now but three generations between a clog and clog. It's amazing how quickly wealth can disappear when you factor in those three forces, division, taxes, and risk. Andrew illustrates the point in the book. He uses, as an example, two parents with a $100 million estate. They have four kids, who each have four kids, who each again have four kids.
the great-grandchildren. Without proper planning and applying just the 40% estate tax to each generation transfer, each great-grandchild will receive just $343,750 out of an original $100 million. While inheriting over $300,000 is not a bad deal, the family fortune is gone. Even leaving $100 million behind wasn't enough to beat the rule of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Now, just imagine if you left behind one million or less. Your financial legacy might not even reach your grandkids. Fortunately, that's only what happens when you follow the traditional estate planning route. There is another way. From entrusted... Assume, for example, that you have sufficient funds to allow one generation to supplement its income, take more extravagant vacations, and retire early. What if those funds were instead used to foster education, provide a small but meaningful down payment on a first home, or provide loans to start a business? For how many generations could the funds last in that scenario? Two? Three? Four? What if those successive generations repaid and or replenished these funds? Would it be possible for a family to create a perpetual opportunity machine? The answer is yes. Finally, entrusted planning is built on a belief in successive generations. It says, you don't need my financial wealth, you just need a start and an opportunity. That belief in a child, grandchild, or beyond is powerful and can be life-changing. Traditional estate planning generally passes a lump sum of money with minor or few conditions which is basically transferring the ends. Entrusted planning focuses on the means and allows the family members to create their own ends. It's based on the belief that the goal for successive generations should be self-sufficiency and independence, and so it focuses on the ability to replicate wealth and not simply on sustaining and consuming it. It's based on a simple but fundamental principle. Successive generations, when given sufficient opportunity and means, can and will achieve on their own. Entrusted planning is Rockefeller-style planning. Regardless of whether you leave one million or one hundred million behind, you can make your financial legacy last in perpetuity if you plan it the right way. Rather than leaving wealth to the next generation, you can leave them opportunity. You can make it so your family doesn't have to start over every generation at zero and instead is able to leverage your legacy to get a foot up in the world. For example, if my descendants have a business idea, I want to empower them to start that business with the family trust rather than leaving them to try to make it happen while working at a minimum wage job on the side. I want to help my kids pay for education without leaving them shackled in debt and I want to empower them to make a bigger impact in the lives of others by encouraging them to make good choices. I want my trust to be a magnifying glass for good and a deterrent for evil. If they're not doing healthy, productive things, then they're not going to get access to anything. But if they are producing value, they will be empowered. For example, I have a deal with my kids that if they read and write a book report on Atlas Shrugged, I'll give them $10,000. I also have other deals in place to encourage them to find and live their sole purpose. So instead of dumping money in their laps that could ruin and spoil them, leading to a life of unhappiness, my objective is to teach them to yearn to earn. I want to avoid creating trust fund babies and instead help illuminate the sole purpose of my descendants. They will not be able to live lives of entitlement, but if they are good stewards, they will live privileged lives. That is the Rockefeller method. And in this book, we want to share with you the financial strategy and key tool that allows it all to happen. Cash flow insurance. 
Michael Isom is the expert on the core of this methodology, and we have both used it to power the Rockefeller method that has changed our family's financial destinies.